Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be back here at FOSDEM this year. Today, I want to tell you about the frustrations I've experienced running tests against public key infrastructure and the tools that I ended up developing in response. So I'm very grateful for this opportunity to share some of that with you here today. First, let me quickly say a couple of things about myself. I work in the PDF industry in the research department at iText. The company I work for grew out of an open source project, and I also do quite a bit of FOSS work in my own time as well. So in that sense, you could say that FOSS is both my job and my hobby. What's particularly relevant for today's topic is that I work a lot with digital signing as well, mostly in connection with PDF documents. And while that's not really what this talk is about, you'll hear them pop up from time to time. For those who are interested, I've also listed my GitHub profile and personal website here on the slide. All right, since we're in the testing and automation dev room, let me spend some time to set up a testing problem that I run into way too often. In order to do that, we need to back up a bit and review how digital signatures work. Most of what I'm about to say is not specific to PDF signatures, by the way. The technological basis of digital signing is public key cryptography. What that means is that every signer has a pair of keys, the private half of which is used for signing, and the public half for validation. And of course, the crucial thing is that there is a mathematical relationship between the private key and the public key that makes digital signatures practically impossible to forge if you don't know the private key. At the same time, anyone with knowledge of the public key can still validate signatures produced using the private one. So what this amounts to is that if you're given a piece of data, a signature and a public key, there is a mathematical procedure that allows you to check whether the signature was generated on that particular piece of data by the private key corresponding to the public key that you have. What the maths don't tell you is who that key then belongs to. And that's where certificates come in. The role of a certificate is to bind a sign as public key to their identity. And we'll talk about what that entails in a minute. But in the meantime, you should remember that a certificate is just a special type of signed data. It's essentially a signed statement by an entity authorized to identify other signers. And that's what we call a certificate authority. Most common formats for certificates these days are derived from the X509 standard that you might have heard of, or perhaps some profile of that. And they're typically attached to or embedded into the signed payload. Now, what's important to keep in mind here is that the certificate itself is not really part of the mathematical signing process. It's just one of the ways to solve the problem of determining which keys belong to whom. In some sense, from the validation point of view, you could even argue that the mathematics is the easy part of the validation process. In almost all cases in the real world, the algorithm that you're trying to use has already been implemented by someone else, and you can just use their library to handle that validation for you. In actuality, the hard part is not so much in validating the mathematical integrity of the signature, but rather in verifying whether or not the signer is who they actually claim to be. In other words, the question that we're asking here is who is actually in control of the signing key? Since that's what certificates and public key infrastructure are all about, let's zoom in on that aspect a little further. As I already said in the beginning, a certificate is essentially just a statement from a certificate authority asserting that a certain key belongs to a certain owner. And this owner doesn't even necessarily have to be an actual person. It could also be a company or a domain name, like, you know, a website. And of course, the CA itself is not an exception to this rule either. So in most cases, you'll have a set of certificate authorities that you trust absolutely. Those are the trust routes. And everyone else basically has to have a path or a chain of trust that goes back to one of these routes. And the idea is that each of these links is backed up by yet another certificate. So in order to validate a certificate, you essentially always have to validate a chain of trust consisting of multiple certificates. In general, to be issued a certificate, the subject must prove to the CA that they control the key for which they're trying to obtain a certificate. The precise mechanism by which that happens is highly dependent on the use case and very dependent from vendor to vendor as well. But the point is that it requires a degree of trust and that therefore certificates are naturally limited in time because trust doesn't last indefinitely, right? So that's why certificates have an expiry date. 
And that already brings into view the tip of the iceberg of complexity that is certificate validation. Because now the obvious question arises, what happens if the key is compromised before the certificate expires? To respond to that need, there are mechanisms by which CAs can revoke certificates that they issued before they expire. There are many reasons for which a CA might want to revoke a certificate, for example, if the key is compromised, if they suspect that the certificate was issued fraudulently, uh, or for any number of reasons. And that means that revocation checking is an essential part of the certificate validation process. This is especially true for high-value signatures like those on contracts and whatnot. The two main mechanisms by which a certificate authority communicates the status of its issued certificates to the broader public is through CRLs and OCSP. CRL stands for Certificate Revocation List, so as the name implies, it's basically just a list of all the certificates that are currently revoked, very straightforward. But for large commercial CAs, these CRLs can get very large and unwieldy, and for those cases, the CA can also offer OCSP access. The way this works is that the CA exposes an OCSP responder service to the internet, and if you want to know the status of one of the certificates issued by that CA, you can send a request to the OCSP responder and basically ask it, hey, is this certificate still valid, yes or no? And again, this is all complexity that has to be dealt with by pretty much all applications that rely on signature validation for integrity. Testing all of that would be hard enough already, but it gets worse. It turns out that it's not just validators, but signers also have to deal with this stuff. Without going into too much detail, that usually has to do with signatures that have to outlive their certificates. And this has significant implications for the software engineering process. Because if you're designing an application that needs to validate digital signatures or produce digital signatures with long lifetimes, then, well, your application needs to interact with those trust services. And that brings us to the central question that I wanted to ask here today. That is, how do you even begin to test such a setup? Because due to the nature of the thing that we're trying to do, replicating these trust services in a testing environment is not always easy. And that's the question I want to focus on for the remainder of my time. The first and most basic thing to note here is that the problem is really about so much more than just generating test data. Because indeed, the generation of test certificates and CRLs is something that can be scripted. With OpenSSL and some bash skills, you'll get pretty far. And while these scripts are more often than not write-only and hard to maintain, it's still pretty doable, all things considered. Now, as the title of the talk kind of implies, the real issue is not so much in the generation of test data, but rather in mocking these online services that you need in a PKI environment. Those include OCSP responders, which we discussed before, but things like timestamping services and remote signing implementations would also fall into this category. And of course, having these test services up and running in your testing environment is only half the story. Because hopefully you're not just testing the happy path in your application, you also need to test all sorts of failure cases. For example, what does your application do if it's served a certificate that's broken in some way? Or a revoked certificate? Or maybe it needs to validate certain exotic certificate extensions that OpenSSL doesn't even handle. In all of these cases, chances are that you'll hit the limits of the bash plus OpenSSL approach pretty quickly. And just as an illustration of how messy it gets, I've included a screenshot of a very small excerpt of my previous testing setup. And I hope you'll agree with me that this is neither pretty nor particularly maintainable. So at some point, my frustration with this process reached critical mass, and I sat down for a weekend to put together an actual solution. And that's what became Certamancer. Certamancer not only generates test certificates and CRLs for you, but it also handles the provisioning of these trust services that we discussed. One of its biggest advantages, in my opinion, is that it doesn't require any scripting. In the vast majority of use cases, you can simply configure it declaratively. If for whatever reason your use case is more complicated than that, then you can always use the Python API to extend its functionality. The code is hosted on GitHub. There's a link on the slide and also on the summary page for this talk. So to wrap up, I thought I'd give you a quick tour of what working with Certamancer is like in practice. Certamancer takes two kinds of input. First, it needs keys. 
Actually, generating the keys is not something that Certmancer does by itself, but you can use a tool like OpenSSL to generate key pairs for most common algorithms. Those include RSA, DSA, ECDSA, and EdWiskerf DSA. Once you have the keys, you'll need to write some configuration. The first part of that configuration involves defining entities that can be the subject of or issue certificates. We do that by defining the entity's name and associating at least one key pair with each entity. And the next step involves configuring certificates in our virtual PKI system. The example on the slide here shows the issuer being set, the validity period, and a couple of very common certificate extensions that you'll find in most production certificates out there. Note in particular that the configuration includes a CRL distribution points extension, which is going to point to a CRL repository hosted by Certimancer itself. And that brings us to the final part of the configuration, namely the actual trust services. In this example, I've included configuration for an OCSP responder, a CRL repository, and a timestamping service. As you can see, this part of the configuration is not particularly complicated. It's just a couple lines and certain answer handles the rest. To see all of that in action, you can run the certain answer animate command and then point your browser to the running instance. From that very primitive web UI, you can interface with the virtual PKI environment that you just created. If you want to see a more extensive demo of the command line interface that certain answer exposes, there is one available on ASCII NEMA that's also linked from the project's GitHub page. I've personally gotten quite a bit of mileage out of Certimancer myself, both in my personal projects and at work. I not only use it for integration tests of various kinds, but I've also used it to couple together a mock server implementation for the Cloud Signature Consortium API. And outside the testing use cases, it's also really convenient for demonstrations, proof of concept implementations, troubleshooting, internal training, and all sorts of other situations where being able to quote unquote, make a mockery of trust is pretty useful. All right, that's all I got. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you have any questions, I'll happily take them now. Thank you.